I welcome everybody to Pediatric Grand Rounds. For those of you who are participating here in the room, there's lunch in the back and drinks, so please help yourself. And I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Meg McNamara to introduce our speaker for today. Thank you, Rafi, and happy Tuesday, everybody. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce an esteemed and treasured colleague, Dr. Christopher Stewart. Stewart. So Chris is a professor of pediatrics here at UCSF and board certified in child abuse pediatrics. Dr. Stewart received his BA from Yale, his MD degree from Harvard, and completed his residency right here at Chief as, uh, in, in pediatrics here at UCSF, where he also serves as a chief. And he is a pediatric hospitalist over at the General and is director of the UCSF Mission Bay and Stanford LPCH Suspected Child Abuse and Neglect, or SCAN, team. Dr. Stewart consults on child abuse cases for several Bay Area County hospitals, as well as consultation and testifying for Child Protective Services and the District Attorney's offices. Dr. Stewart co-directs a child abuse rotation for residents at Stanford LPCH and at UCSF. And as community service, he co-directs the child death review team for San Francisco County. He sits on numerous regional county committees and CBOs related to child abuse and neglect. And I can tell you that he is in constant contact with any of us who happen to reach out for his um, expert opinion about how to manage things. And for that, I know I speak for all of us when I say we are indebted to your counsel. He is a member of the Ray Helfer Society, an honorary society of physicians seeking to provide leadership to enhance the prevention, diagnosis, and treatment of child abuse and neglect. Dr. Stewart has also been PI on several federally and state-funded international research training grants. Dr. Stewart has been involved in many international projects for which he was awarded the UCSF Chancellor's Award for Public Service, has received a number of teaching awards, and has provided lectures and training in international settings, including training in the Eastern Democratic Republic of Congo, and recently to Syrian doctors documenting torture cases. And with no further ado, I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Stewart, who's gonna discuss, can we address racism in the child welfare system? Welcome. Thank you, Meg, and thanks uh, very much for that kind introduction. I will start off just with um, an outline. I, I want to go through uh, racial disproportionality in the child welfare system and have people come away from this talk with a, a couple numbers that they can remember around that. And then I want to look at, at, at a couple of, of several theories about race, why that racial disproportionality exists and some of the implications of, of buying into um, one or the other of those theories. And then particularly, I'd like to get to considering some potential anti-racist strategies that might be employed on the individual, local, or sy systemic levels. And uh, I would love to hear during this, this discussion or, or later other folks' ideas about those, um, other folks' experiences around such um, anti-racist strategies and their challenges and potential. So first off, I'd, I'd like to make clear I'm not an expert on this topic. I'm not a full-time supported researcher although I have many friends who are. Um, I have spent a couple decades here as a white male university professor of pediatrics who does child abuse <laughs> pediatrics work. And in that work, although the, in, in child abuse about around the country, but about two thirds of the cases, 60% of the cases are reported for neglect, I tend to see the, the more severe neglect cases or physical abuse cases or sexual abuse cases or what we call medical child abuse, which we have many of in this hospital, which used to be called Munchausen's by proxy. Um, so those are the type of cases. And, and so much many of the cases that I'm talking about in aggregate aren't, aren't the ones that I especially deal with on a day-to-day -day basis. But I do get consulted often about whether 
we should report to CPS. I get calls from individuals or clinics and often the question is less about management, but more, do we need to report this at all and kind of talking through that. So I just wanna throw out the, the scope of a potential problem. And I'm not using audience response system because of my technology um, challenges and just to play it safe, but I, I have thrown this slide up um, with audience response. And if you just think about what fraction of kids by the time they're 18 in the United States are investigated by CPS, you can think about what number you might pick. And, and for many, the, the number is, particularly the audiences I talk to, the number is quite low. When I talk to certain audiences like clients out in the community, CPS social workers, they might have a higher number. If you, the, the data shows us that about a third of kids, so one out of three kids has a CPS investigation. And that's kind of amazing if you think about it. The, we have a system in place that, that ends up investigating a third of our children. And so that's one of the potential problems. Is this child welfare system too big? Is there too much um, focus and money going into the reporting and surveillance and potentially removal of children? Yes. Can you tell us a little bit more about the data pool where that's drawn from? Because I agree that that does seem very, very high. Yeah, so it's, it's from different, I mean, they, they have the data for actual reports to CPS and I can share with you those. We have very good data at, a, at UC Berkeley locally. We have, and I'll show some more California data, but if you go to, there's a site I'm, I didn't put the link here, but um, UC Berkeley has a site where you can look at all the reports, all the CPS reports by type, by age, by county, and compare them. It's, I, I think I'm surprised by this, but we'll talk a little about affinity bias. And I tend to hang out with other people like myself who are relatively well off, white, um, you know, in a very privileged position. And it is interesting if you talk to, to other groups, maybe not that you're less, have less affinity with, um, they are less surprised by that number. But the, um, I, I will pull for you, Meg, the exact data on that. But I think if you Google it, you can, you can find the, where that comes from. And then here's really the, the overlying problem is that nationwide 13 percent of the population the 13 percent of the kids in the nation are black and yet of the kids in foster care 23 percent are black and if you divide the 23 by 13 that's where you get this one number i'd like you to know from this so that one third number i'd like you to take away as wow a lot of kids are being investigated by by the child welfare system in our country and then that disproportionality index is, as it's called, 1.7 for black kids to end up in foster care. And that race, racial disproportionality, that dis, disproportionate distribution of, uh -oh, of, uh, of a group of children in a system or setting. And for example, it's different than the proportion. I'm not sure if it's better to just plow through. Um, but the idea of disproportionality is that, you know, a disproportionate number of a group in one place versus the group in the whole setting. So an example that I, I find, it, it can go both ways. When I go to DEI trainings at UCSF, there is a disproportionate number of white men in those trainings. Way less white men are in those trainings that are in the UCSF faculty population. 
In this case, this disproportionality we see in the number of black children ending up with CPS investigations or in the system. And when you look at this, I could show a number of different slides, but I don't wanna, I, I wanna get to strategies we might use. But when you look at, at this, you can see it, it depends on where you are in the country and this disproportionality also affects different groups in different ways. But in general, in almost every state, black children have this disproportionality of contact with the child welfare system. And um, that's, that's kind of, overall it's 1.7. In California, we're particularly bad um, relative to other states. We're one of the worst states in terms of that disproportionality index. So just for California, you can see about 25% of children um, from a birth court, a both birth co cohort study um, were investigated by the age of 18, whereas 50% uh, of black and Native American children were. So another Another point is that uh, of the reports that are made, not all those reports end up being substantiated. And so the, the child welfare system process for those who aren't, aren't as involved in it as myself is there is a report made and we're all mandated reporters, right? Um, or most of us in this room would be. And we know that in California, the law says, if you have reasonable suspicion of child abuse, then you make a report as soon as possible by phone, by calling the county's hotline, um, the CPS hotline for that county. And then we're supposed to, within 36 hours in our state, send in a, a brief, a brief fax in a brief um, report on that. Then, the child welfare system, the CPS intake, has a number of options, including evaluating out or, or kind of ignoring or not really taking the report to a full investigation. And in some cases, it's intervention and, and surveillance of a family. In some cases, more extreme removal of, of a child into the foster care system, and then eventually, potentially, those children may be reunited, reunified with their families, or they may end up staying within that system and exit into um, adulthood from that system. And again, in California, you can see these, uh, these numbers are worse than in, in many other states, although they are part of the cumulative uh, 1.7 disproportionality we get. And you can see that uh, black children are, are more likely to have allegations against them. They're more likely to be substantiated. They're more likely to enter the foster care system and they're more likely to stay in care. They're less likely to exit that system. The, it's also a huge issue in California for Native American kids. And you can see the uh, other groups have other results there. And if we, you could look at this, but on the county level and on the state level and see the differences within different places that you may practice. The, the, the interesting point is that when you control, if you control for poverty, then some of these racial disparity are mitigated or even disappear. And so this is just data from university. Like I said, the, the California Berkeley Indicators Project where folks can look up, that's the website, um, where folks can look up all kinds of data on what we have is reported to the system and the outcomes of that. But this brings up kind of a, a, a larger question that I'll get to in terms of thinking about what, why and where the 
disproportionality and, if you will, the racism within the system or without the system exists. This is just a quote by um, the program director for Family Children's Services in San Francisco and just gets to the, the fact that those numbers, when presented, should spur people to think about what's going on here and is there solutions, is there anything we can do about this? The, the child welfare system uh, certainly has a, a long history and many articles kind of document the inherent racism, structural racism in that history as reforms have been made over time, often um, reforms that are focused on getting kids out of poverty, getting kids out of um, difficult situations and specific exceptions to those which target black or other non-white populations and really take away the service aspect of the system in those populations. This is a um, orphan train back in the mid 1800s, about 200,000 mainly white children were were shipped out to the Midwest to be in better families. So that is an example of the idea was to take these poor kids with no opportunity and put them in families that um, may have more opportunity. Black kids were accepted from this, this effort. And it's, it, it's a, the beginning of an example where that type of, of reform and then exceptions went through th throughout the history of the system. I'm happy to refer anyone to articles around, around the history, the, the racist history of the child welfare system if they're interested. But thinking about underlying factors that might cause racial disparities, there are these historical factors um, I, I referenced in the way laws and policies were enacted or accepted, uh, made exceptions to in certain um, states particularly. And then the, the, the influence of poverty, right? That wealth, income, education, employment as a, as a part of this health disparities, exposure to adverse childhood experiences and geography all are part of this uh, but, but there, there have been some debates about where the disproportionality, or excuse me, why it, it exists. And I, I said, I just wanted to focus on two theories. Here, here are, are four of probably the main theories about that. Uh, the two on the bottom that there are factors in, in the child welfare system in terms of knowledge, attitude, and behaviors that are insufficient to address families of color, and that there's geographic factors such as concentration of poverty in certain neighborhoods. But, but the two that have gotten a lot of attention, and particularly this, this first one, is that poverty causes the disproportionate risks. And we saw when, when you um, controlled for socioeconomic status and poverty in the California data, how the, the, some of the disproportionality disappeared. The, I've, I've had come and talk at some of our conferences. W one of the researchers who has this, who supports this, this idea based on their research and, um, I, I don't want it to be misunderstood. The, 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 the point that they are trying to make is that when it's, it's agreed that there is that 1.7 disproportionality index, there's no question about more black children disproportionately go into the system. But they, their, their data shows that after controlling for poverty, black kids are substantiated a little less often than you would expect. And once in the system, they go into foster care a little less often than you'd expect. Um, and the black parents have their rights terminated a little less often. 
They do find that, however, that once um, in foster care, that they stay in foster care longer. So unfortunately, I don't have the research chops or the skills to really um, analyze myself, but talking to um, many colleagues, there's a lot of problems with the way they, that data is presented and looked at. Um, and the, what, the, 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 the point that the folks making this argument are saying is the child welfare system itself is not racist. And it's really, we should put the money not into reforming that system, but instead into addressing poverty, right? That that's the, that's the real problem. We should address poverty as an issue and then this will disappear or not be such an issue. The, the racial bias theory of this is that biases on the individual level and policy systems level, in other words, institutional racism, are responsible for this disproportionality. And because racism or bias is part of all the systems within the processes, as you go through um, the child welfare system uh, or the child welfare system being one of those systems that there's, it's inherently part of that child welfare system. And I, I think when, I've, when I think about kind of personally the data, there's a lot to support that there's obviously by, th these systems are very human, right? And, as humans, we all understand our implicit biases. And it's been known for even on the kind of in the, on the ground level of responding to a, um, say a head trauma case. There, uh, there's a seminal article by Jenny, where she, um, Carol Jenny, who's now retired out of UW, but she looked at kids who were missed um, for abuse of head trauma, what we used to call shaken baby syndrome, and found, and found that a third of the kids about were missed cases. Be, um, when you look back, they had been seen by a healthcare provider and something was up, but that should have been noted. And the other interesting part of that study was that kids that were missed were more likely to be white, kind of high socioeconomic kids. So there, there's many other studies, one out of CHOP looking at fractures and the way um, emergency room doctors respond to the same fracture. And just again, demonstrates the bias or disproportionality in reporting or workup for black kids or, or and even um, kids with low socioeconomic status. So it seems to me that on the viscerally and in my experience, the, the bias is obvious at, at many levels within this human system. There is, there is uh, I'll, I'll just mention here, there's also data that when CPS workers, when the, the CPS worker who's deciding about removing a child or not, or, or making some intervention in a family after a report, are blinded to the family and just given the information, they are less likely to report or to um, intervene in Black families than not. And so we'll talk about that as a strategy, but it, it does kind of, again, emphasize that there's a lot of humans in the system and we all know humans have, we all have our biases. Another thing that's that kind of to think about is the, the harm, which is a fundamental concept for, for child abuse. We think about what's the harm being done to the child and then the decision whether we need to intervene to protect that child. But when we think about the child welfare system involvement, are we balancing or considering or have we properly studied that the type of harm that might come from a removal and, and or intervention? 
the majority of, of as I mentioned, the majority of cases of reported to, to CPS, child welfare system, are due to neglect. And that clearly has links with poverty, as we've discussed. So what are we really protecting in many of these neglect cases children from? Is it, is it are we trying to protect them from poverty? And if so, are the interventions we're, we're taking appropriate? There is a lot of data to show that foster care outcomes are, are not good. I think people intuitively know that. And it often, I, I think that may um, factor into people's consideration about making a report to CPS in many cases. You can see that uh, all, all these really not good outcomes for kids that go through the foster care system. And so then this idea of reporting, which is part of the system, and I, as I said, we're all mandated reporters, is, a, is an interesting thing because it is very easy for me to say, you know, just make the report, right? And then that covers me potentially legally. I, I'm not worried about that child, someone coming back later. And I do see and involved sometimes in lawsuits where, where a family um, will sue a hospital or an emergency room, for example, when a report wasn't made. Um, even, even someone who may have been the perpetrator of abuse might sue the hospital for not making a report and then the child ends up dead or, or severely injured. So there is, with this mandated reporting, there's kind of a, a tendency to let's just cover ourselves and report. Um, and it's not our fault it's that we're doing this because we're told to do it and we could lose our licenses if we don't. So, um, and, and then on the other hand, I there may be a bias thinking about the foster care system and the intervention of CPS and destroying therapeutic alliance where reporting isn't used in cases where maybe some type of support should be, should be offered or um, even mandated. And so it's, a, it's just the, the mandated reporting issue is an interesting one I'll come back to at the end. But in general, I think, and, and Jamila constantly talks about how language is important. Jamila's here who's just joining our child abuse um, team as a program manager and very um, honored to have her to be able to work with her. But she, she often, reminds us about the kind of language being used as we're thinking about making a report, you know, a very vague and non-objective language in terms of the type of parenting, the, the way someone parents, and is that uh, a white normative middle-class parenting standard that other folks are being judged against. We also just happened to review some of the, some of the protocols in the NICU and looking at when drug testing should be done on babies. And, and some of the language in there was very um, subjective and uh, problematic in that regard. So, so where do we go from here? Should we, perhaps some people suggest, and this makes sense to me, so separate neglect cases and not call them child abuse, call them something else and deal with them in a different way, not in the, the CPS reporting system? Should we abolish the whole system as some folks have, have suggested? And even thinking about some of those, it seems overwhelming, like I, I as a person can't do any of that, right? There's, so I just want to throw out some, some possible actions people might take individually as as you if you think about this as a problem, and some of these actions may apply beyond the child welfare system or child abuse pediatrics, but more into your your um, academic life or other life in general. 
So just a list of possible things that I'm going to go through. And then I, as I said, I'd love to hear other ideas or get, get feedback on any of these. Some, many of these I'd been involved with attempting to and, and looking at uh, implementing. And some of them I've been involved with more as a supporter or in a secondary way. But the, the first thing is kind of doing your own work and there is ample opportunity to do this. So if you've never heard of any of these or all, if you haven't heard of some of these, it, it may behoove you to take advantage of some of the opportunities at UCSF that has, or outside of UCSF where you can learn about your own biases. You can, can learn about things like microaggressions and how you might be able to not be a bystander but actually be an upstander and, and have the courage to address them in the moment or in an appropriate way. I, I mentioned at the bottom affinity bias, which um, is an interesting one to me. As I think about who I, when I'm at a conference, who I'm likely to go and sit down with at the table at lunchtime, um, who as a student, uh, I'm likely to want to mentor or want to help with a project. Um, it, it's really interesting to look at that from the perspective of affinity bias and why am I feeling comfortable with this person um, or feeling positive emotions and wanting to help them. And just looking at that in our own lives, in our own, depending on where we are, our hiring practices, our the type of people we hang out with, are we getting diverse perspectives or are we further kind of isolating and cocooning ourselves within potential bias? So um, that the idea, the persistent self-awareness, constant self-criticism and regular self-examining, I think many would recognize comes from Kendi's book, How to Be an Anti-Racist, who talks about the opposite of racism is is not non-racist i'm not a racist but anti-racist actually active engagement which takes a lot of work um, and i often reflect when when i think about the amount of work sometimes it does take to address a microaggression or think about redoing um policies how much work it, it just having a, a tiny sense of how much work it might be to exist in a system where constantly you feel and you're dealing with microaggressions or other issues, other kind of racist issues. Um, I was very uh, fortunate and honored to join a group of, of peers uh, at the invitation of Lee, Lee Atkinson McAvoy um, about three years ago now, I think as uh, George Floyd had happened and there was a lot of discussion in the country and we um, uh, did this 21 day anti-racism challenge. And if you Google that, you can find all the materials and set one up with your own colleagues. But that was just incredibly helpful to listen to my colleagues and their experiences and to go through in the group our own white fragility and deal with that with the incredible patience of Lee and, and Dr. Carol Miller and others in that group. And so there's a lot of work you can do on your own um, to not be or to, to try to attempt to be less biased as, as a piece of the systems that we work in. I was also um, on, uh, fortunate to take part in this training that I, anyone can do. We're all generally educators, right? We're, we're all dealing with trainees. And UCSF has certificates for teaching. And one of the new ones is equity and inclusion. And it consists of uh, a number of workshops and 
So it's, it's, it can take, you're expected to do it over maybe two or three years, but again, a chance to uh, sit and listen in groups of colleagues and think about um, actual skills to address racism or microaggressions in the moment. And those types of opportunities, I think, are, are ones that we can all do on our own, on the individual. The other thing is just creating space to discuss racism. So many of us are educators or in charge of some groups that get together. And just a comment like, like the one there um, at the beginning, at the orientation, is, is one way to potentially allow discussion about this and empower folks to in folks that may not feel it invite them to bring up issues and i've used this both in my, in my rotations that that students or residents do for child abuse and even in other situations um, when dealing with for example meetings with cps folks It's really challenging my, con my concentration here. Um, oh, we hang up? Let's see. Ignore, Ignore the call. The call. Okay. Thank, you, Thank you. So just touch that and it'll light up. <laughs> Thank you, Rex. Okay. So, um, so I th one of the one of the students at the School of Medicine did a look at the um, the program, the, the anti-oppressive curriculum initiative, which many know is the the program at, at UCSF, the new kind of or a, a piece of the medical education. And he he was uh, he interviewed faculty and found basically that UCSF faculty think this initiative is great but in general don't feel like they have the skills to talk about these issues and that the students are way more competent and versed in the language and kind of methods of say addressing a microaggression in the moment and i think this just gets again to the fact that many of us can use uh, constant training and constant support and these are not easy it's not easy to stand up in a room and, and confront something, or even with your patients, um, when you're going on rounds and one of the patients says something to the, a team member, but it is important to those team members. And I've, it's, it's been, I've, I've heard many times from, from folks at how disappointed they've been in not having their leader step up or step in for them, even after the fact, just checking in with them about issues like this so so that 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 also includes in the child welfare system when i'm in groups discussing say a potential perpetrator sometimes the language used about the perpetrator or um you know the language used about the family is is something that you have to call out um and and this is difficult when you're in a meeting with law enforcement and other folks that don't tend to talk about these issues as much openly. So applying those tools that you learn is, is basically what I'm saying. And an, another example of that is a DEI checklist that's come up for medical educators, which is a, I, I'm happy to share it with anyone, but in those teach for equity groups, it was kind of a self developed through various groups, a, a list of if you have a presentation, for example, like this one, and I'm using pictures to, sh to show an example, <laughs> am I, how am I using those pictures? And what is that? What am I trying to get across there? Um, if I'm, you know, in one, in one statement, have a picture of black kids, and then in another white kids, Am I getting the right message across? Am I being um, thinking about DEI and being diverse in the way I'm presenting stuff material? We've uh, gone through a lot of our 
child abuse pediatrics material in, in both our teaching and in our outward facing messaging like websites uh, at, to try to look at that. So it's one strategy you can use. Of course, also asking colleagues to review something we've done and just say, hey, you know, how does this look? Is this, is this am I being um, sensitive to DEI issues as I talk about this and the way I talk about this? I think another important thing is to collect and analyze data. And at UCSF, it's interesting. Uh, this is true when I went to, I, I actually have a half-time contract with Stanford and run a child abuse program there as well. And when we started out, we had no idea how many CPS reports were being made and who was making them. And so it took a lot of work to actually get that data kind of in a way that we get a process in place where we were, were getting what we thought, what we think are most or all of the CPS reports in our system. And Jamil and I are, are strategizing how to do that here as well, because it's the same issue. There's not a, there's not a clear way to look at the data. When, when we looked at it at Stanford as an example, one thing that jumped out right away was a disproportionality in, in terms of uh, Spanish speaking patients. And we immediately looked at um, interpreter services as a possible intervention for that. As you can imagine in, in child abuse cases, the history is so important. And so if the history is taken by someone that's not, that's not a native speaker and details about it are, are considered red flags, that's, that's a big problem. And so kind of mandating um, interpreter services, even if the parent uh, might say, no, no, I don't need that. Uh, really thinking twice about that and bringing in interpreter service in, the, in those cases is just one example. Supporting uh, anti-racist or, or DEI research, even if you're not a career researcher, I think um, offering projects to trainees and um, studying issues like how many cases actually help protect children from their parents, maybe looking locally, like I said, at our own data, but even in bigger systems. I've talked a lot with Matt Pantel, who, who does um, this type of research kind of on a big aggregate data uh, methodology. And he, uh, we've, we just recently were discussing the, the issue of, of poverty and racism and how they go together and how to, how to address that when you're looking at these issues. Um, but it's in, important to A, do this research, but also if you are in a, in a division or department, and I hear many, many of these division or department leaders saying we can't, we're having such trouble attracting um, underrepresented resonance into our programs, one way might be to show that you're interested in the research and highlighting work that you can do. And, and it's easy to invite students to do research. I, in, an, in another hat, I, I am an inquiry advisor in the School of Medicine and I have about 50 students at any one time looking for projects to do. So if anyone is interested um, in getting a, often with monetary support, a student to help you do such a project. There's a lot of interest among student body and that can maybe get students interested in going into residency in your specialty and maybe residents interested in going into subspecialties. So just one strategy that may have implications beyond child welfare system. Screens and protocols. Uh, I, t I talked about Jam Jamila saying how important language is when you make up protocols and screenings, but these can be maybe very helpful. For example, how, how often or do we consistently report, say, if a child is injured by not having proper restraints in the car and comes into the emergency room? Do we have, we don't have a policy for that. And so without that, it just, 
it just makes the likelihood of bias in those decisions to report to CPS so much higher, right? So if there are ways to not over-report, not, not trying to, I'm not advocating let's report everyone that comes in with so-and-so, but trying to make policies that will, will get people to be more consistent based on a protocol rather than using their own judgment, which, which is problematic. The idea of a CPS timeout, Heather Briscoe at SFGH has done a lot of work. She, put to, she helped with a number of stakeholders over a long process of about three years, including CPS and folks, um, put together an equity toolkit that includes this equity timeout, which before a CPS report is made, there's kind of a huddle and the team will discuss a number of factors um, that, that the family might have, like uh, protective factors, other factors. And one of them, one of the things to consider is, is there bias in the way we're approaching this? It is it, for myself, colorblind reviews with colleagues. So I often, when I have a case and I think to myself, I've, I've met this family and now I feel like there's some bias here, I will send it to one of my colleagues um, and with just the facts, kind of here's the x-rays, here's the story. They're not seeing the, the family in, in front of them and having all these um, particular biases and that may be helpful as one strategy. And then I talked about interpreter services as another. And then finally, policy work is something that may seem daunting again, particularly if you're a clinician or in clinical practice or full-time researcher, although that often blends into the policy world and forming policy. But there are many opportunities. I've been really lucky to be on the board of an organization called Safe and Sound that used to be called the Child Abuse Prevention Center and was, was started by Mitch Grossman, um, who was at the, at the general about coming up on 50 years ago. And one of the things that over the last decade working with that, that organization, they've gone from a really grassroots kind of, we do good work, so why, why examine what we do to really having a, a, a rigorous business model and thinking about um, kind of the outcomes and, and driving their work. And they've, because of that, they've realized that although they are focused on, on very intensive work with families within our community, they also feel they have a voice and need to do policy work. And they just put out a brief. If you Google Safe and Sound San Francisco, you can see the brief on their website. And they are very involved in this kind of movement towards um, reforming mandated reporting to community supporting. And they're supporting a lot of legislative um, agenda, legislative proposals, as well as a lot of work within our community, within um, San Francisco, to, uh, to strengthen family resource centers as places where, where families locally can get support for mental health issues, substance abuse issues, and, and things like that, that are tied to, that are often overlap with abuse and focus on supporting those families to keep their children rather than uh, are all of us paying someone else to take care of those children. And then on the more, on the more, I guess you'd say radical end of this, if you check out the up end movement, this is the abolitionist movement, not, not unlike defund the police, um, it's a very grassroots, but, and they're, they're not the, if you look at the website for them, they're not so clear on solutions um, as, as, but they're very clear about what, what we need to change. And I think I like the, the approach that Safe and Sound is taking kind of with concrete solutions to the ideas that the UPM movement has kind of as ways to, 
change the system that may be more supporting and doing what we think it should be doing rather than um, more punitive and focused on surveillance and really with a huge cost both to families and ourselves as taxpayers. So just summarizing, I, I think hopefully there's people understand their support that there's racism in the individual and systems related to child welfare and that there's a number of strategies we can use uh, individually that you can take and that we can take uh, as, as within systems to address these. So I am hopeful for the future, despite uh, seeing the, the tough, tough realities of the present. And I will stop there and take any comments. I think we have about five minutes or so. Anybody who's on Zoom to please enter your questions into the QA and I will monitor them from here. The first lady, anybody in the room? Quick question. Um, back uh, when you uh, were talking about um, foster care. And I was just wondering if a child is maybe a place that is in the family, maybe not parents, but extended family, where a parent or family member works, does that qualify as foster care? Or yeah, it's a great question. Um, the question was, are when when the data shows about kids placed into foster care, does that include family placements? And I, my understanding is yes, it does include those. And and child welfare system in general these days, I, I will say that the folks that I work with in the, are very aware of these issues and, and are trying to address them. It's as, as, as I've said, none of this work is easy and it takes time and real effort, but um, the general over, over decades, there's been kind of child welfare has gone from wanting to or tending to remove children more um, to trying to keep them within the family or or develop a response that includes the family decisions and trying to look at families strengths and um, so in general they would like to place a child with a relative if possible that's not always possible for various reasons, but. So Chris, clearly there, there needs to be um, some data collected about people who see these kinds of untoward. We can analyze whether um, race is disproportionately influencing people's decisions. But thinking about that and your, and the acknowledgement that we all have biases. I'm wondering if there's a way, or if, if the agencies that are involved in these kinds of decisions can have the pure person who's making the decision be, um, you know, not have access to that information so that it is a little bit more objective instead of having that unconscious bias. Yeah, thanks, Meg. That's, it's, it's another good question. Is there an opportunity for folks making the decisions to have to be blinded, if you will, to the to the socioeconomic or other factors, race factors of the families. And um, yes, that 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 is done and it's done in different ways in different places. I just um, was at our national uh, our national conference and one of the presentations was talking about both blinding and um, some places blinding. And so they do in CPS, I think it was in Colorado in, in one county, they, they do try and not discuss when they get together, they don't put on the board or they don't have that information. But, but there was an argument on the other hand for actually including the information and some, some counties or responses will include it because putting it up there then forces the discussion about is this a factor in the in the that this was reported to us at all and should we consider that so it's an interesting question i think um 
I, I think, again, that's what needs to be studied. Like, do these outcomes, do these interventions change outcomes or these approaches change outcomes for families in a positive way that, that continues to protect and or support children and families to thrive despite, you know, other challenges within the family. A couple of questions on the Zoom. So um, one is asking um, about a specific website that you use to reference the data. So perhaps rather than me um, stating what they've typed out here, you can just go back to see if it. Yeah, I think, um, I think I, you're talking about the Berkeley site probably. Yeah. And I will, yeah, I'll leave that slide. This, I, I believe these slides are all available also on our, and I'm happy to send them to you. That's true. It, this, this will be put up on the, um, after the grand rounds when it's posted. Um, and then the other question uh, um, was specifically about the CPS pod. Um, this is being, um, uh, who attends the, the I, I think that was specifically in reference to the intervention that Heather Briscoe had Oh, so Heather Briscoe's um, equity timeout. So that that's interesting. That's focused in that's been focused in the nursery, uh, particularly around um, reporting parents when there's substance use disorder issues. So the question it's a it's a big topic. Who should be screened? And every hospital screens babies differently. Some do urine on every kid, some as Jamil and I were going through our policy and it it had again that interesting language of if if a parent appears to be a drug addict or something like that, then and and what does that mean? You know, how is that decided? Then we're going to do the screening. So at the San Francisco General, because there's such the, what they did is got together with OBGYN and PEDS, the the NICU folks, social workers, they got CPS to come in and, and agree to, so uh, agree to kind of look at those cases and have a protocol that seemed to support families and not punish them when the um, substance use disorders were an issue. Who actually is involved? I think at least a social worker and various like um, the attending residents, and you can you're supposed to be able to call anyone, but I don't believe that they involve the family in those meetings at first. They then go and talk to the family afterwards. Yeah. It's not particularly a question, but I I would love your reflection on. I think one of the places that we struggle a lot with particularly now knowing or sort of speak, speaking that child welfare systems can cause their own version of harm and when we try to then overlay um, better policies that, that then allow for one path with each patient presenting in a similar fashion. I, Camila and I talk a lot about the kids, the babies who come in for workup for non-accidental trauma babies. And, and at that point, right, they're being admitted for no medical in reason other than the evaluation. And, and then there's this stated concern. Is that the moment that you make the CPS report? Because there's a concern for non-accidental trauma. And if we're talking about bias within the workers, within our system, that perhaps is the moment, but then, what is the harm caused by increasing the reporting? And so I, I just like it. It's, it's my best example of where we are when we're trying to improve systems and uh, decrease bias and also attending to what harm we cause with these CPS reports. Yeah, it's another great question. And, and the example is if, if we often a young child, baby, or, or less than a year has some injury. And because we need to do a skeletal survey and maybe other imaging, we'll admit them for a, an, an NAT workup, but not really for any other medical concern. And the question is, when is, how do you address kind of equitably uh, making reports in that? And I guess I have, I have over the past years, been much more careful about 
making reports. Although in my profession, it certainly puts you at some risk to not make a report. Um, I really, in, in those cases, many times uh, we find out that a story is quite believable and um, is consistent. And I, I, I guess the answer is it's complicated. And I, I, I would say we sh if we're gonna do that, I, I, I'm not in favor of the reflex report everyone at that point. I, pr I think I'm more leaning towards let's get all the information before we make that report, considering the potential harm to the child that we may cause by doing that report, which is relatively easy for us. Thank anyway, so thanks much, everyone for their attention. Thank you very much, excellent. Okay.